So I come from the University of Pompeu Fabra. Um, the work I'm going to present here is done in collaboration with the, also the University of La Sapienza in Rome, and also with Gustavo Deco, who is here also. And it's about neural variability response of neurons in dorsal premotor cortex and how they are influenced by the history and their correlation with behavior. So, it, well, it's kind of dark, but imagine the situation in which a rat is going through an environment. So, at the beginning, it could be that it, it uh, decides basi basically in reactive action, but once the rat has learned about the environment, at each bifurcation point, it's kind of obvious that he will, it will also use uh, the memory or the experience that the rat has during the task. So from here, we can ask ourselves, uh, how are these two things integrated to make the decision? So how do we integrate perception and memory? And uh, we have been working previously in an architecture which is called distributed adaptive control architecture, which we use with robot to precisely study how we learn or how the robot can learn about the environment based on how rats do it. So here, we have reactive action first, and then once the, rat, once the robot learns about the environment, we also have memory and contextual control, which also is taken into account to make decisions at the end. So the prediction from this model is that when we make decisions, I won't go through the details of the equations because it's not necessary now, only that when we make decisions, our decisions are biased by perceptual matching, so by perceptual and instantaneous information, but also by, by memory prediction. So what happened to us or to the rats or to the robots before. However, mainly of the previous work in uh, neurophysiology and using well, animals and subjects um, have focused on decision makings with instantaneous information. So the role of memory has been quite ignored for a long time and this is exactly what we want to study here. And using neural data and also behavior from monkeys, we will try to answer how memory or experience during a task influences the, the decision making process. And well, the work I'm going to present here was just published last month, so if you want to check more details, this is the, the, the reference to the, to the work. So the first question we want to answer, then we will see that we have also a second question from, from, the, from the experimental data, but the first one we wanted to answer what, uh, was, what are the neural mechanisms which biases uh, the underlying the integration of memory and, and perception in decision making? And to do that, we use the countermanding task with our movement. And we use that, that task because we already knew from the literature that the behavior of subjects or monkeys doing this task is influenced by previous trial history. So it was like a very good context to study this integration of memory and perception. And well, this is the task. <clears throat> As I said, it's, yeah, it's the countermanding task and the monkey uses our movements to, to respond to the, in the different trials. There are two kinds of trials which are called the go trial and the stop trial. Both of them start uh, equally, like there is, there is a central stimulus on the screen and the, the monkey in this case, because it's our movement, has to hold the central stimulus with the arm. And after a random delay, normally between less than one second, uh, the central stimulus moves to one side of the screen. And that means that the, in most of the cases, that means that the monkey has to reach that target, to the right or to the left, depending on where it appears. But, and this is like 67% of the trials in, a, in one experimental session. But it could be that after some delay, the central stimulus appears again and the, and the target disappears. And that means that the monkey should stop the plant movement. And uh, while we, this, this work, <laughs> these experiments were done in La Sapienza in Rome and they used two monkeys and they recorded from the dorsal premotor cortex. And this is the main behavior which has been observed in this kind of task. So this is for both monkeys, monkey S and mo monkey L. So the probability to stop a movement uh, um, decreases, so the probability of failure, sorry, increases as the delay between the stop, the go, which is the, when the target appears in one side, and the stop tra uh, signal, which is when the central stimulus appears again, increases. So if this is too long, 
the monkey cannot stop the movement anymore. So because he already planned to do it, so it's more probable that he will fail. And this kind of behavior in this task has been explained with the race model. And the race model says that there are two processes in our brain going on, one which favors the movement of the, to, to go to the target, and one which favors the, the, to cancel the movement. And whenever one of these two processes reaches a bound, uh, a bound then the decision is made. So if this is the goal and this is a stop, if this wins the competition, then the, 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 the movement cannot be stopped anymore. And as I said before, uh, this is what is already in the literature. So they, they, they found that the behavior of, this is for, one of them is for humans, I think this one, and this is for monkeys. But the behavior of the monkeys and the humans are influenced by trial history. For instance, if we look at this part here, this means three plus stop, and this is the reaction time in the following go trial. So here we can see, for instance, that reaction time increases as the number of stop trials in a row increases. Okay, and well, this is all the influence of trial history in the behavior. So <clears throat> what we want to do now is to correlate this behavior with the neural activity observed in the dorsal premotor cortex. And to do that, we look at two things, the firing rate and the neural variability of the response of the neurons. And for the neural variability, we use the same measurement that Anne was explaining yesterday, the variance of the condition and expectation, or bar CE. And we calculate these two things based on the trial <coughs> history. See, the trial history is our condition. So just to go to remind you how bar CE was calculated, what we did is that we used the, the response of each neuron split, sorted by condition. So here we have the number of trials for one condition, and this is time. So we, we, we use a temporal window of 60 milliseconds, though although longer windows also lead to the same result. So this is just like kind of a standard. And what we did is that we moved through the trial and we count the number of spikes that we encounter here. And after that, well, you can imagine this is a matrix, it's not a vector, because it, we have many counts in, a, in the time. And to calculate bar C, what we do is that we calculate the variance in each epoch, and we subtract from there the unscaled, um, the mean spike count, but scaled by, the, by, by this factor here, which was calculated as the minimum final factor per neuron, if you remember it from yesterday. So first of all, this is the behavior that do, we found in our data. So first we wanted to see if we actually had the modulation in behavior due to trial history, and we did. This is the reaction time in a go trial when it was preceded by a go trial or by a stop trial. So as you can see here, the reaction time is longer when the go trial follows a stop trial than when it follows a go trial. And if we look at the following trial, so what happens if here it appears a stop trial, we see that the probability of failure is also different. So the probability of failure is, is higher when we found a stop trial after two go trials in a row. And it's lower when we find a stop trial after a stop and a go. And this is kind of trivial from here or kind of expected from here because when we have a stop plus go trial, the reaction time is longer. So that means that the monkey takes longer to move and therefore the probability to stop uh, the plant movement is, is higher. <coughs> and uh, we did the same analysis by looking at the neural data. So we look here at the GO trial and the activity of neurons in dorsal premotor cortex during the GO trial when it was preceded by a GO or by a stop. So this first, the left panel is aligned by GO signal, whereas the right panel is an aligned by R movement. And this is firing rate and this is bar CE. So as you can see here, we have an increase in firing rate after the GO signal appears, but in both cases, the increase has the same rate. So we cannot distinguish between both conditions. And the same happens when we align the data to the R movement. So they are overlap. But if we look at bar CE, we observed that bar CE was higher in the case of having a, go, a stop trial before a GO trial, and lower in the, in the other case. And it, and it it stays like that, it remains like that uh, till the movement is made. So 
Here we have a peak in activity, and then it goes down after the movement starts. It was between 0 0.2 and uh, 1, something like that. I mean, because I have one field value of per neuron, so I have a distribution. And uh, it was more or less between 0 0.2 and 1. Mm -hmm. Or 1, yeah. So we looked at the single units to see that the effect that the result that we found was not uh, due to an average or an effect in the average that we got. And we can see here, so we plotted the average activity in this <coughs> epoch here because it was when the, the, the both signals were significantly different. So we plotted here. Um, bar C for go plus go trials and bar C for stop go trials and the same for firing rate. And we see that if there is no modulation, most of the dots are in the diagonal, which is the case for the firing rate. But in the case of bar C, we have a modulation, so we have the dots uh, above the diagonal, most of them. And we looked at also a longer sequences to see if the result, the result hold. And we see, we see that it does. So here the reaction time decays or becomes shorter as the number of stop trials decreases and the number of go trial increases. And the same happens with bar CE. And also, well, this is mean reaction time and also for the standard deviation of reaction time, it follows the same trend more or less. So it goes down also with the number of, of, of go trials. And this is the, the same, but for the mean firing rate of neurons in the same epoch. And as you can see here, it is not really modulated by trial history, so we cannot use this to predict behavior. However, if, if we put the mean reaction time together with, um, with bar CE, we obtain this quite high correlation. So we could say that from bar CE, we could predict which would be the re mean reaction time. And this here is a QQ. Q, Q plot, so it, uh, it means that we are plotting the, different, the data from the different distributions to see, so if they are in, the, in, this linear, in this linear line, then that means that both distributions come from the, from, from the same shape. And as you can see here, they are quite similar because they are almost in this line. And the question that came from this uh, first experimental results was why does reaction time vary if the firing rate does not vary? So that was one of the questions that we had once we saw the data. And if you remember what I explained about the race model, um, you can see that it cannot be explained by a race model because we didn't observe any change in firing rate and we did not observe any change in threshold. So if we use the, th the race model, you can imagine that we could have differences in reaction time, but for that we need to have a higher rate here or a difference in threshold to explain that, but this is not what we observed in the neural data. So because we wanted to be constrained by that, what we did is that we used an attractor network of binary decision making, which is based in the equations of Wilson and Cohen. And this is how it looks like. So there are, so um, originally it doesn't have this monetary system, so it has two pools of neurons, which are the go pool and the stop pool. And the go pool is sensitive of the appearance of the go signal and the stop pool is sensitive to the appearance of the stop signal. And both pools inhibit each other, so they, they, they compete to take the control of the, of the system. And they also have recurrent connections. So we added to that network the monetary system. So this is a, this is a, a system which provides a, a signal into both pools which is based on the previous trial history. So we make it bigger for when we had many stops in a row and smaller when we had many goals in a row. So this, 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 uh, this signal here simulates the, the different trial history conditions. And this is how the, so this is how the dynamics of the, of the two pools work. And uh, well, as you can see, the activity of each pool varies uh, following a sigmoid, sigmoid function. So here you have both equations. And what we did, because 
We constrained the model so that the activity in the go pool was always the same, independent on the trial history, because this is what we observed in the data. What we did is to, to say that the decision was made when the difference between stop and go pools reached, reached a certain th threshold. So the threshold is not in the activity of the go pool, but in the difference in activity between both pools. And first of all, what we did is to replicate the main behavior of the task so that the, that the probability of failure increases with the step signal delay. And this is what we, I showed to you at the beginning. And then <coughs> we obtained, bearing this, this signal, the monitoring, system, the monitoring signal, we obtained the same trend in reaction time and neural variability. So as you see, it decreases with the, with the, with the sequence. And in the firing rate, we had no modulation at all, so as we wanted to have, because as I said, well, we constrained the model with the same things we observed in the neural data. And to conclude, so the question that we had was what are the neural mechanisms underlying the iteration of memory and perception in decision making? And we observed that we can say from the, from the observations that we had that presence of information uh, and memory are integrated using separate variables. So presented information is caught in the firing rate, whereas the response variability represents the memory or the trial history in our case. And uh, changes in mean reaction time due to trial history could be predicted by the across trial variability in the response of neurons in PMD. And the next question we had was why does reaction time vary if the firing rate does not change? And the answer to that was that uh, our simulations show or predict the, system of the existence of a trial monitoring system which is changing the reaction time and the variability of the response. And what can be, needs to be answered now is whether these systems is internal or external to the premotor cortex. And well, that was it. And these are the people that well, did the work together. Both of them, because we look at them separately, but the result was the same. We decided to put them together. Okay. So did you see? But, but did the the variability depend on whether the previous, whether you looked at only the successful ones or? or no. The so the result was the same. The bar C was B, was more or less the same in both cases after an error or not error. So we okay. decided to put them together. Okay. So it wasn't it wasn't due to the fact that you were mixing no. you know, mixing together trials for that outcome? No. It didn't seem. Okay. And then the second one, just can, can you just give an intuition for how the model predicted the reaction time effect? I'm, I'm just kind of confused because um, the, the relationship between the, R, the RT and the VRC is really interesting. But, but from the point of view of a given trial, mm -hmm. like when the model is making a prediction of a given trial, VRC has nothing to do with that, right? VRC is an across trial mm -hmm. measure. So how does, how does the model? Well, for the model, we did the same. So we had like a number of trials, and we repeated the same condition, and then we, we measured the variability across trials also, as we had in the neural data. So you can, you can predict which will be the reaction time in a given trial if you know already which is the reaction time for that trial history, let's say. But for that, you, also, you need a bunch of trials to be able to predict that. The modeling, you mean? The, uh, sorry, the, and the monitoring system that you have in your two pool mm -hmm. tractor model, is that monitoring system roughly equivalent to what I'm calling cognitive control? Well, yeah, it could be because we added this monitoring system, so it could go, yeah, to a kind of cognitive control. I don't know if that's. And, and, and following on from that, do you, do you have or do you plan to report from the ACC? Mm. 
No, it would be interesting to look at that, but I, I'm not doing experiments myself, so I don't know if people are willing to do that, but yeah, it could be interesting. So, I mean, at the end you asked the question whether or not the monitoring system is external or internal to the <coughs> premotor cortex, and you record it from the premotor cortex, so you should see signatures of that somehow if it was within the premotor cortex. Um. <coughs> Yeah, but uh, maybe we could look at that in a different way. So now we have the signature of trial history in the, new, in the response of neuron in the promoter cortex. But we didn't look if, uh, yeah, in a way, in some way we could have also a monitoring system there. Maybe we should do some kind of analysis which is not beyond that that we did here. Yeah, but maybe we could check actually. No, it's only the mean. So what we are doing... Also the, the 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 oh, so the thing is that um, here when we vary the monitoring uh, signal, these two weights are different. So this unbalances the influence of the monitoring system. So for instance, this weight that goes to the stop pool is bigger than this one. So that, that means that we, when we are changing this value, we are not changing equally to both pools. And therefore, when this is bigger, the influence of the stove pool is bigger than when this goes down. And that's adding the noise to the system. Mm -hmm. Yes, you do, because if you don't have this input, then you change the firing rate of the go pool. I mean, if you... Yeah, if you only add input to this, then the competition will be this, will increase it more. Can you explain why Yeah, because of this competition. So when the monitoring system is higher, this competition is also stronger. Because this input is higher. Because of this weight. And therefore this has a higher impact in the dynamics of the whole system and it's adding more noise. So it changes the distance to the bifurcation point and then you have more. 